I don't know how to open this video. Usually I say hello, but that's pretty generic. And last time I opened with a sketch that was related to the fourth doctor, but this time, I really don't know. Just cue the titles in history. <laughs> The Fifth Doctor was played by Peter Davison from 1982 to 1984, lasting seasons 19, 20 and 21, spanning an era of three years overall. Characterisation wise, he was definitely the most human of the incarnation so far, as well as being the youngest until Matt Smith took that uh, honorary title. His era introduced the Mara, a nightmarish entity that more or less looked like a giant snake in our world. And while they haven't appeared in the new series, the fairies in Small Worlds, a Torchwood episode, was partly based on them. Pteroleptors, alien reptiles that are fondly remembered due to pretty convincing animatronics, are also memorable monsters from his era, but they have yet to make a reappearance, though they were name dropped in the Pandorica Opens. But in terms of new monsters, the Fifth Doctor didn't have that many that made too much of an impact, relying on monsters more from the past due to his era celebrating the 20th anniversary. I will admit, Five may have been my first classic Doctor, but he's not one of my favourites, and as I find him a bit bland at times, well, a lot of the time, and he's often been the least interesting part of his own stories, Peter Davison is a fantastic actor, don't get me wrong, but he wouldn't usually make an impact as far as the character was concerned. However, that doesn't mean he had great stories worth talking about, so let's begin. Number 5 Snake Dance This is the second appearance of the Mara after making their first appearance in Kinder, and while it's not as experimental as their previous story, this is more traditional Doctor Who, but that doesn't make it a bad story. In fact, quite the opposite. The TARDIS arrives on the planet Minusa, which is the former homeworld of the Minusan Empire and Sumaran Empire, but it then triggers nightmares in the Doctor's companion Tegan. The Mara are reasserting themselves within Tegan's mind, following her possession the last time she encountered them on the planet Diva Loka, and it's up to the Doctor and Nyssa to make sure the Mara never return. Janet Fielding as Tegan gives one of the best possessed performances in the show's history due to Tegan's personality completely changing when possessed. She goes from the mouth on legs we all know her to be to a withering stare, wicked grin and a chilling voice that suggests demonic evil. The Doctor in the story is also seen as a blithering idiot with no justifying his claims of the world ending due to the planet Minusa being a planet of peace that's celebrating their victory over the Mara. The set design is also sublime due to the place being a carnival. It allows for some really striking imagery and some really convincing sets, such as the scene in the Hall of Mirrors. And there's not really much more negativity I can throw at Snake Dance other than being not as good as its previous story, Kinder, but with great direction, striking set design, sparkling dialogue, great performances, and a focus on thought rather than action, Snake Dance is easily a story well remembered in the Fifth Doctor's era. Number four. The Five Doctors. Now, technically, this story should be called The Three Doctors, A Guy in a Wig, and Some Stock Footage, but that would be too obvious, and obviously the title would be too long. And I'll explain why in a bit. The Doctor's past incarnations, as well as past companions and enemies, are taken out of time using a time scoop and placed in the death zone on Gallifrey, with each Doctor being manipulated to breach the defences of the Dark Tower, which contains Rassilon, the founder of the Time Lords. What I like about the Five Doctors is its celebratory feel. There's plenty of old faces to see, like Doctors 1 to 4, past companions such as Susan, the Brigadier, Sarah Jane, and plenty of small cameos from K9, Jamie, Liz Shaw, etc. However, getting all these people back wasn't easy for the production team. Tom Baker didn't want to come back, and so his presence was filled in by stock footage from Sharda, an unmade story, 
and in the story itself, he was left trapped in the time vortex and until he was released at the Five Doctor's end. Furthermore, William Hartnell, who played the First Doctor, had passed away at this point and was played by Richard Herndl, who looked a lot like Hartnell to play the First Doctor. And in terms of lookalikes, Herndl does a great job. It's easy to spot the differences when you've watched William Hartnell so much, but other than that, it's a really great performance. And it's great seeing Patrick Troughton and John Pertwee again. They seamlessly fit back into the roles of Doctors 2 and 3. It's like they never left. The Five Doctors is more or less a celebration, and it feels like that in every sense. And while it is overcrowded because there's Daleks, Cybermen, the Master, and even a Yeti, it still also looks ahead to the future. And it successfully does this by expanding the mythos to the Time Lord Society, with the character of Rassilon that the new show sadly ruined, which involves a pretty good twist involving his immortality. In this story, I mean not the crap in the end of time and parts of Hellbent. But with a great sense of nostalgia, old faces, new faces, and a celebratory look at the past, as well as an expansion of the future, The Five Doctors is best celebrated with cake, tea, and jelly babies. Number three, Kinder. Now, remember a few minutes ago when I listed Snake Dance as my number five choice and mentioned it wasn't as good as its previous story, Kinder? Yeah, this is the story I was talking about. The TARDIS lands on the planet Diva Loca, where Tegan falls asleep under strange wind chimes and becomes possessed by an evil force. Meanwhile, the Doctor and Adric meet a survey team of humans studying the natives of the planet, the Kinder, but they're on the verge of collapse due to members of the survey team going missing. What works so well about Kinder is its psychological feel to it. Tegan's nightmares are done brilliantly, as while there's surrealness and bizarreness to the dreams that you usually see, there is subtext regarding her relationship to the Doctor, Nyssa and Adric which I'll allow you to figure out if you watch the story. They work as well as they do due to great direction by Peter Grimway, who also allows the jungle sets to feel like a real jungle. And while it can look a bit plastic at times, for me, it looks great. And he'll definitely go down as one of this era's best directors. Not to mention the supporting cast are all incredible. Sanders, the leader, looks like a pen pusher on the surface, but he goes along with the madness that the crew member Hindle has suffered for fear of antagonising him, even though Sanders is the leader and he could easily stop him, but he chooses not to. Neris Hughes as Todd proves to be a very resourceful character, as well as being the only sanity in this madness and the only one who will actually help the Doctor. But the standout performance for me is Simon Ruse as Hindle, as his descent into madness is played flawlessly, and he comes across as so helpless but also terrifying at the same time. If I have criticism, it's the Mara aren't too well realised on screen, and the snake ends up looking like a giant vacuum cleaner tube, but it's thankfully been improved for the DVD release, but it's still a flaw nonetheless. But with a great cast, superb direction, surreal imagery, and lush looking sets, Kinder is one of the most thought provoking and original stories Doctor Who has ever made. <laughs> This story is very special to me, as it was the first classic Doctor Who I ever saw, so you can imagine I am pretty biased towards this story. But, nostalgia aside, Earthshock is still shockingly good. No pun intended. This story involves the Cybermen wanting to destroy a peace conference that have united against them in 26th century Earth, using a bomb in caves first, and then a huge freighter that will crash into the earth, destroying the conference. On paper, the story is pretty basic and often events happen just because the plot says so, but it's the shock return of the Cybermen that makes this story so fondly remembered. Before the darkness that was the internet, the viewers at home had no idea the Cybermen would return in this story, and part one is intentionally structured to misdirect viewers on who the enemy is, and the cliffhanger to part one is one of the best in the show's history. The reveal is just perfect. The Cybermen came back after a seven year absence and were given, in my opinion, their best design along with their look in the 10th planet. They'd keep this look for the remainder of the 80s, 
and it's a great look in my opinion. This story is once again directed by Peter Grimwade and he gives the story atmosphere. The cave sequences look great and the freighter scenes just look gigantic. Furthermore, the action scenes are very well directed and they don't come across as clumsy like some in classic Who do. The Cybermen are also on top form here as they come across as efficient killers that won't stop until they complete their objective. David Banks as the Cyber Leader is also a standout for me as he comes across as pretty menacing even if he is a bit too emotional at times and a bit pompous. Maybe at cyber school this Cyber Leader forgot that emotions are for the weak. There is also another shocking moment. Okay, I'll stop with the puns. At the climax of the story that involves one of the Doctor's companions, but I won't spoil it here in case you don't know, but just so you know, it was pretty shocking to watch, even for people back in the, the 80s. With brilliant direction, great action, great performances, and an iconic villain brought back with style, Earthshock is an action-packed highlight of the Fifth Doctor's era. Number one. The Caves of Andrazani. Surprise, surprise. Yeah, I know, this is nearly every fan's favourite, but you haven't heard why I love this story yet. The Doctor and Perry are caught in a war for Spectrox Toxima on the planet Andrazani Minor, which is the most valuable substance in the universe, but when the Doctor and Perry touch raw Spectrox, they must desperately find a cure before their time runs out. As I said in the introduction to the video, the Fifth Doctor, I feel, is often the least interesting part of many of his stories, but this story I see as a culmination of many downbeat events that happened in Season 21. For example, in Warriors of the Deep, he left a sea base full of dead bodies. Tegan chose to leave because of the death and destruction that happened around her. Turlo chose to travel to his own planet rather than stay with the Doctor and the Doctor was forced to kill the robot Chameleon after he betrayed the Doctor to the Master. And in this story, the Doctor will save Perry, a person he doesn't know very well, from death because he knows it's the right thing to do before he himself regenerates. This is what makes the Fifth Doctor at his most interesting for me, and his actions are so much more epic here than saving the whole universe or fighting an army of Daleks. Peter Davison is on top form here as the Doctor, as he's put through hell, he's shot at, tortured by androids, tied up, crashes a spaceship into a planet, but none of that matters as long as he saves Perry because it's right. Nicola Bryant, who was fairly new as, as a companion at the time, is also brilliant here, as it's her first trip in the TARDIS and she faces death so early on in her travel. Every supporting character is fantastic here. There are no good people on this planet for the Doctor to turn to for help which makes the war all the more hostile. Sharp as Jack, played by Christopher Gable, is one of the most scariest and most chilling villains in the show's history, and his obsession with Perry's beauty is powerful stuff that the new show I doubt could do today. Everything about this character is brilliant, from his look, his voice, his mannerisms, his backstory, it all creates a brilliant anti-villain. Not to mention, it's superbly directed by Graham Harper, who directed it as if you would a film, and it really shows given how inventive he is with the camera angles, and it's no wonder he'd come back to work on the new series. So yeah, like a lot of fans, this is my favourite Fifth Doctor story too. Everything about it just works for me. The acting, direction, music, writing, it will definitely be remembered as a classic for years to come. Well everyone, that's all from me. I hope you enjoyed the video. Let me know in the comments below what your favourite Fifth Doctor stories are. Be sure to like and subscribe, follow me on Twitter, and I shall see you all next time. Mustache.